So that's it. We're good to go. I believe so. Oh, wonderful. Are we gonna? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. I'm sorry for that. I was on mute. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, great. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is May Worry. I am the uh, artistic director and CEO. So that's it. We're good to go. Yeah, we're good to go. Oh, wonderful. There's an echo. So, let me see. I think that was me. I think I had, I have a bunch of screens open. That's so okay. There isn't any. Um, okay. So thank you all so much for joining us uh, and attending this very special conversation. Um, it's been a joy and honor to collaborate with Sophia Nali Allison on this event. I hope that you were able to view her film, A Love Song for Latasha, which premiered at the 2019 Tribeca Film Festival, receiving the Grand Jury Documentary Prize at AFI Festival, Best Documentary Short at the New Orleans Film Festival and Black Star, um, as well as an IDA Documentary Award nomination. It was also included in the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. None of this could have happened without Sophia's vision in making the film and reaching out to us to host the screenings this weekend. I also want to send a major shout out to Imran Siddiqui, our communications director, who's been operating all the technical production and marketing for this event. And also I'd like to thank Nahad Khadr, our program director, for working on the structure of the panel. Um, thank you to all of you in the wider Black Star community, most especially our staff and board for sharing information about the event on your personal pages. Um, I'm really excited that each one of the folks said yes for this panel. I'm going to briefly introduce them and then hand off to our moderator. Also just to note, if you have a question, please leave it in the comments on Facebook or tweet us at Black Star Fest with hashtag a love song for Latasha. Uh, and now a little bit about our panelists. Denise Davis is a producer who got her start in indie films and music videos, most notably The Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl. She's currently a producer on the series Insecure, and she serves as COO of Color Creative and produces and oversees content for Issa Rae Productions. Dream Hampton is a writer and filmmaker from Detroit. Lene Denise is an artist, scholar, and writer whose work reflects on underground cultural movements the 1980s and electronic music of the African diaspora. She coined the phrase DJ scholarship to reposition the role of the DJ from party purveyor to an archivist, cultural custodian, and information specialist. Marcus Anthony Hunter is a professor of sociology and chair of the Department of African American Studies at UCLA. He is the author of Black City Makers, How the Philadelphia Negro Changed Urban America, Chocolate Cities, The Black Map of American Life, co-authored with Zandria F. Robinson, and the new black sociologist. Sophia Nali Allison is a filmmaker, photographer, and dreamer. A native of Los Angeles, she is a 2020 United States Artist Fellow. She has a master's in visual communication from UNC, and past projects have been featured on The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The Root, and with Los Angeles Film Forum at MOCA. And you can read more about each of them on our website. Uh, I'd like to remind you again, if you have a question for today's panel, please leave it in the comments uh, on Facebook or tweet us at Black Star Fest with hashtag a love song for Latasha, and we'll do our best to get to them. Uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our moderator, Marcus Anthony Hunter. Thank you so much, Mayori. I really appreciate it. And shout out to everyone streaming us on this beautiful Sunday. Um, it is an honor to be here and we are in for a wonderful treat. Uh, not only do we have a wonderful film to discuss, but we have the director and creator and also some of the most brilliant, wonderful people in the world, Dream Hampton, Denise Davis, and Lene Denise. Uh, so first I want to start and we'll make this a conversation. And just so folks who are watching understand, before we started, I asked the speakers to just present some hands, a finger, a peace sign, a thumbs up. So I know where we can all know where to transition to create that rhythm we're used to of the in-person conversation as much as possible. But uh, for everyone who's watched the film, I'm sure you've all been very moved by it. I hope for those who were not familiar with Latasha Harlins that you all understand and know who she is and what she means for all of us in the culture. For those who already understood her, I hope that this representation shows you another iteration of her, one that is full of joy and love so that we can think about how to take a tragedy like this and move forward in a place of love and joy. So that'll be the overall kind of tone for the discussion today. But I wanna first start off by asking the genius director creator, Sophia, 
uh, I see a lot of what we call in the West African tradition, the Sankofa principle, going back to get something. And oftentimes when we invoke that principle, our ancestors are telling us that everything that we think we've gotten from that treasure box, there's still more in there. And so I want to start off by just asking on behalf of the good people, how did Latasha come to you? And, and why do you think that is? Thank you, Marcus. That's such a beautiful question. And thank you, everyone that is watching right now that has been watching the film this weekend. Uh, I'm truly I'm sure. just so moved and grateful for your participation in this and our wonderful panelists and Black Star. So you know what, Marcus? This film was the first time I really began to understand what it meant to be in conversation, conversation with ancestors and to do the conjuring work of allowing their memory to, to be around us, for their energy to be a part of us. And energy can either be created nor destroyed, it just is. So when I was doing research on Latasha Harlins in 2016, I was really disturbed by the reality that there was not information beyond a headline. There was not information beyond her trauma. Even her, you know, her birthday, we just mentioned this before, but her birthday is listed incorrectly on Wikipedia. So who are the people that were in charge of documenting their story? What were those power dynamics? And I really wanted to see a film that honored this young woman and that allowed her to finally live in her fullness. And when I say finally live in her fullness, I don't want to take away from the work that has been done from Denise Harlan's Latasha's late aunt, who created the Latasha Harlan's Justice Committee and was an advocate and a, a voice of keeping her name alive and, and fighting for justice and the community that remembered her and, you know, family and friends. But every time I'd seen a documentary about her, it always incorporated the footage of her death. Um, and everything was always in relation to that trauma. So ironically, I was living back home in Los Angeles at that time, uh, at 2017, when the 25th anniversary of the LA uprising was occurring. And I was working for a production company and I pitched the idea of let's do a story about Latasha Harlins. Let's really know who she is. And they completely turned it down without even so much as a discussion. And at that moment, something clicked in me that I have to leave. I can no longer work with a, a system that refuses to acknowledge the importance of my existence and the existence of other black women and girls. And so with the support of like several friends, I completely quit and just went on a two year journey of what does it mean to reimagine this, to invite the spirit of Latasha in, the memory of her in, and to rebuild an archive. So. The conception began in 2016 and 2017 is when I just felt this pulling at my spirit to keep going. And there were times where it was extremely hard because I was working to dismantle what I'd seen in documentary, how I'd seen such colonized practices, um, but really being led by the spirit. And I feel like I'm just so grateful that Latasha was a part of this journey and that Ty and Shanice were a part of rebirthing her memory. So from 2017 being told, no, I can't do this, no, this story isn't relevant or important, it was always this, this desire to keep this fire that did not stop burning of this story has to be told, it has to exist no matter what roadblock um, occurred at that time. Thank you for that uh, beautiful insight. And it isn't lost on me that we're approaching the 20th and and this sort of comes to you in the story at the 15th year, but also in a magician sense, which is also a story about how difficult it is to get stories about Black women and girls out for people to understand and consume. And so that also then leads me to Emmy-nominated author, writer, everything woman, Dream Hampton. You know, what are your thoughts thinking about that when you see the 19-minute the film, a love story, love song, you know, remembering mm -hmm. it, uh, and thinking about your own work around trying to remember on behalf of Black women and girls. Uh, I just am curious about just your initial thoughts when you watch it as a spectator like the rest of us. Yeah. Um, I'm so grateful that Sophia um, not only went about the work of remembering Latasha, but also went about the work of reimagining and being thoughtful about her approach to this. And in so many ways, Sophia, I think you were liberated by the rejection of studios um, who would have definitely wanted a more straightforward documentary. I mean, I've had that experience for sure, where you're collaborating with like some big behemoth of a company and all kinds of things, you know, um, there's lots of compromise in that. <laughs> I just <Yes>. learned. <laughs> um, 
I, in this moment, am pitching a story um, that has been passed on by six of the eight studios that we um, pitched um, that centers like a, a black woman. So that story isn't, um, th that story of like not getting much traction with even pitching these ideas to studios um, is still very much a constant. But this idea of memory, um, I mean, I remember Latasha Harlan's and I remember, you know, Latasha being one of the very few um, beginning of what we felt deluged by um, mid, you know, last decade, which was these videotapes. Um, I remember seeing the videotape of her murder um, played again and again, you know. Um, and I don't know that we had the language back then around trauma porn or we certainly didn't, you know, I mean, even her, you know, in the, in the, in your film, Sophia, um, you know, she talks about being kind of worn out from having the video play so many times. So I know how thoughtful you were, what a decision you made to not include the video in the piece. Um, but at, at the same time, that's one of the things that's absent from this film, right? Just like she's absent from this mm -hmm. film. Um, which was one of the kind of challenges that I had, say, with Treasure, um, making a film about someone who was really young, so hadn't formed in so many ways, um, and who was absent. And so all of these things I'm considering as I, you know, watch this film. I'm also thinking, and I don't know if I'm like pulling this from my, I'm projecting this onto your film, but I, I'm also thinking about some of the cinematography. I know that you shot your own film, Sophia, and how so much of it reminds me of like Charles Burnett um, and those other kind of love songs to Los Angeles. Yes. Um, yeah, so, and, and I really appreciated that. Um, finally, I, I think that you were making this in a moment where there was a real demand by Black women who were organizing, the Say Her Name campaign is what I'm getting to, um, had begun to kind of um, have legs and voice. I mean, at first there was this open letter to the Obama administration when they began their kind of boys mentoring program and um, Brittany Cooper and um, Amani Perry and all of these, um, Monique Morris formed and wrote this incredible letter. Um, and then of course, uh, the work of uh, Mariam Kaba and um, Andrea around, you know, just the erasure of black women as victims um, in our imagination. And by our imagination, I mean, black people. And Tupac, bless his soul, made that impossible, you know, with Latasha. Like in the moment, he reminded us, you know, what had happened and wouldn't let us forget that. And, yes. and so all of those things are like my first thoughts on this beautiful film. Um, what's missing from it, you know, what's intentionally missing from it. This kind of love note to Los Angeles and the 80s, which I'm sure Lene Denise will talk about. Um, and just the decisions that you made, such careful decisions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trini. There, there's a quote I want to mention that really inspired this journey, just because you talking about erasure, dream, that's something that deeply affected me and, and even the fear of my own erasure in the process. And what does it mean when black women have been erased or our stories have been discarded? But I was, um, my, my partner, who's also the creative producer, Janice Duncan, she had me reading a lot of Zora Neale Hurston during this time. And I read a book by Tiffany Ruby Patterson that looked into the work of Zora Neale Hurston. And she said, history lies not in official proclamation, but in lost hidden places that wait to be found. And earlier, she even begins to say how historians often imprison themselves when they rely on um, texts that they deem as factual, when so much of our history has not been recorded, has been oral history. So what does it mean when we begin to fill in those gaps? Also the work of Sadia Hartman, Venus and Two Acts, of what does it mean when we reclaim our power by saying we see what's missing, we see what's been erased, but this is a memory and a spirit that cannot be discarded.
it may appear to be a race on the surface, but we are going to the root. We are digging deeper. So thank you so much for just mentioning, you know, how hard it is to rebirth almost our, our stories when there has been, it's been intentional, the erasure of our existence. Thank you for that. And thank you also for invoking all of the names you have. I hope folks watching and listening are keeping track of the scholars, workers, and activists that are being mentioned by these brilliant people uh, because you're getting a tour de force, a uh, quick bibliography of a long history of work by Black women in particular, but Black people more generally. Uh, along those lines, thinking about producing stories, thinking about stories about Black people, it leads me to then producer Denise Davis of a show you may have heard of, Insecure. What is that like and as a producer? working contemporarily producing images and stories about Black women, how did you see yourself or your work or your, your journey toward that in what we saw in the 19 Minutes produced by Sophia? Yeah, well, I want to start by, by talking about um, a love song for Latasha and how that it made me think a lot about the work we do with Insecure and what that means today. And, I think it's because, you know, what Sophia did so well in this film is really humanize Latasha and give her a voice and, and make her present in a conversation that, like we said, had been erased to a degree. And I think as Black women within the media, you know, it, it's so appalling and so telling when you look at the history of film and television as Black women in the center of that, as Black women as protagonists, as the, the leaders of these stories, how we're missing in that and how the, sh the few shows where we are present and seen outside of the BET platform, quite honestly, um, we're, we're absent, right? And so why films like A Love Song for Latasha is so important is because it's able to look at a moment in time and, and honestly allow her to be, um, allow her to be presented as who she was and not how we, the media had portrayed her to be. And so when I think about Insecure and what that means, you know, a lot of what we do with that show is, is not try to make it a show for every Black person. We are honestly authentic in telling Issa's story and the story that she feels like she wants to tell as real people who live in Los Angeles, who have these lives and aren't fictional in the sense of we're trying to teach people, uh, teach white people about how black women live, right? It is these particular women who are who they are and that's okay. And I think by taking ownership in our stories and by allowing us to tell multitude of stories of who we are, um, it's so important, right? Because we're not a, uh, we're not a monolith, that we're not all the same. And more importantly, I think by even what, what, what has made the show so special is we fight all the time to keep it as authentic as we can, to keep it grounded, to be shooting in the neighborhoods that we want this, the, the show and these uh, characters to live in and make it seem real because we know they're real. We know they're real. We live it every day, right? And so when you're given a platform to tell a story upon, um, I think it's our duty to be accurate sometimes when you're depicting uh, humans, when you're depicting people who are real. And the minute that you go left of that, the minute you decide to um, you know, to have the liberty of, of going away from the truth, I think is what is harmful in allowing other people to spin our stories, right? And we saw that with Latasha to a degree. Latasha didn't have a voice, therefore the media, and I think the emotions of that time around uh, what was really going on completely allowed it to, um, to spin the story. And she got lost in that. So that's, that's my piece. I'll, I'll end it there because I could talk about that all day. But, um, you know, I, I think it's why... Uh, our show is important in the conversation, but more importantly, I for one want to see a lot more shows beyond Insecure, and so far we don't have those yet, so. Thank you so much, Denise. And this, uh, in this, the first circle of our conversation, I wanna come to professor, DJ scholar, overall everything person, uh, Lene Denise, this is also your village, your chocolate city. You were not only somebody who's watching this as a spectator, but also as somebody whose feet were on the ground, walking, talking, living. And I'm also curious just how, what your insights are, how you kind of received that film, those 19 minutes in conversation with what we've heard so far. I mean, first and foremost, I felt like the film was justice um, to some degree for Latasha and her entire family, who like me, 
watched the video of her murder next to Rodney King's beating for like an entire year, um, making an assumption that justice would be served because we finally have proof, right? This is one of the first times that these things have been captured on tape and it was used to kind of shape public discourse. <laughs> Um, against our sort of better judgment that justice would be served. Um, but what stood out to me in this film um, was definitely the ways in which she is humanized, um, but humanized through the use of palm trees, humanized through the use of beaches, and the fact that the opening scene is this Black girl facing the ocean, right? So we get to see her in this, with this sort of speculative lens. Um, she still gets to be with us, or rather I was able to kind of feel like she is still with us just through engaging the back of this little black girl. Um, I felt like Latasha Harland was me. And so I, I wrote a piece about her story um, in 2015. And one of the things that struck me as I began to sort of just write the piece and think through it was that I had no information about her. I only knew that she died. I only knew that she died violently. And so I had to kind of think through a line of questions also as a way um, of humanizing her, like where is she from? Who is Denise Harlins? Why was she sort of like her you know, her representative um, in terms of the media, and and where was her mother and her father? And 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 came to you know learn about yes, some of the kind of tragic stories that um, defined L.A. in this kind of post crack era um, time period, where you know her mother and her father were. Um, you know, I, a part of, I'll just say, sort of like a community's disappeared people due to reasons connected to the war on drugs, um, you know, addiction, and then thinking about Latasha Harlins and what it meant for her to hold this and the way that the film kind of centers her role as, you know, a sort of community, community guardian, um, a protector of her peers. Um, was interesting to me. And so even, you know, learning things like the fact that this is a young Capricorn child, this is a young dark skinned child, this is a young potentially tomboy child um, who is navigating these streets, these hostile post crack, you know, but also community centered streets. And so that was interesting to me, um, just the use of LA as a character. And I love the dream talked about Charles Burnett and this kind of love letter to LA and Sophia sort of, um, you know, glances into or turning her lens into the black Los Angeles home, the dripping water, the sink, the telephone cord, gently swinging and kind of allowing these ghosts to kind of tell the story as well. And I, and I want to be honest that I watched the entire film hoping to not see the video again, hoping to not see, um, you know, um, her lose her life again, because that was the primary way that I, you know, sort of introduced to her the only way. So I was really glad that Sophia spoke to the women, the girl children around her. Not to mention the use of dance. One thing that stands out to me is that there are these little girls making up dances um, in the opening sort of part of the film where I'm like, that's a huge part of Black LA culture. And at that time, we were making up dances to Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation. We were even trying to make up dances to Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit. We were calling ourselves like reciting lines from Malcolm X, you know, from Spike Lee's Malcolm X film that had also just come out. So, and then Ice Cube's, you know, um, Death Certificate album too was a, was a regular <laughs> album, you know, on our record player. And he was talking about what was happening in black communities and particularly the tension between Koreans and black folks. And so I was just like, you know, thinking about Latasha and wondering what kind of music she was listening to versus wanting to recall how she died. Like, did she make up steps too? You know, um, did she want to be a crip like I did <laughs> in the 1980s? Because I did. And it was interesting to hear how she kind of protected, you know, her folks from these gangs, what it meant to kind of navigate South Central LA, um, but also see some of these gangsters as family, as cousins see some of the dope dealers and the dope boys as uncles, as protectors, and trust them in ways that we didn't trust the cops necessarily. So I just feel like there were details and it was just like this nuanced storytelling without doing a whole lot of rehashing of those details that, you know, sink us um, in this sadness. And so I'll stop there. Thank you for that first circle. We're gonna make another circle, of course. This will just be an experience of circles in part because when I, 
watched the film, there was just a lot of, I saw not just spirituality, but a lot of West African spirituality. So for example, even Lene's point about the black woman at the ocean, shout out to Yemaya, you know, I, I see that and their use of blue and purples, the spirit, Yemaya, Okosi, all built up in there. And that led me in part to start just with the fundamental basic and I'll start with Sophia and then we can circle however we like in this, uh, but, uh, it was 19 minutes and I couldn't help but do the numerology. One plus nine is 10, 10 is new path. And so I see you going back and getting her Sankofa, the ancestor Latasha, to give us a new path. And as Lene just mentioned, and Dream, and Denise have mentioned the use of film and the use of production to capture black life. And in this case, what was captured most prominently about Latasha was her murder. And you find a way to not do that and it makes me think a lot about the phrase, the love song. So moving forward in a new path with love, and, in, and for folks who love music like I do, I think we all do, uh, 1991 is the same year that Luther Vandross gives us power of love. He's living in Los Angeles. So when I saw the 19 minutes, 1991, over and over and over again, it just felt like 1991, 19, 19, just kept seeing that number. Luther, power of love, power of love, love song for Latasha. You could just say a little bit about that, the intention behind calling it a love song. And then I want us to talk a bit about music and how music can amplify love, even when we're talking about the painful parts of Black life. Marcus, that really gives me shivers because there were so many times during the filming where things were only working because Latasha's spirit was allowing them to work so many times where we just felt her spirit making things come together. I can get into that later. I don't want to take up too much time on, on that, but there was a moment where my creative producer Janice and I went to her middle school to, to look for yearbooks of evidence. And we were told there were no more yearbooks, but then a man walked into the office and he said, no, 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 the librarian keeps those all. Mm -hmm. my, we went there without telling anyone we were stopping by. We go to the library, the librarian, Mrs. Booker, lets us in, takes out a box of yearbooks and she's helping us find anything we need. And in that moment, we find the evidence we needed of Latasha in the school yearbook. Ty even comes over, starts hanging out with us and reminiscing. So, so the fact that you're finding all these spiritual connections, just a, a, it brings to light how this film happened and the manifestation of what it means when you put the spirit first, of her being in dreams, of Janice having me write letters to Latasha, of constantly thanking her and raising her name whenever we were out filming. Um, Lene, very quickly, I have to say, I wanted to be Harlem 30 Crip. And <laughs> my, my brother, he beat me up. And I went to school the next day in middle school and told everyone I was Harlem 30. I was thrown up. I got jumped into a gang that neither one of us were in, and I'm telling everyone at school. Also, uh, Denise, the way you speak about insecure, what I love is it's a secret language. It's a secret language amongst people from Los Angeles. It's a secret language among Black folks, and that's what a love song for Latasha is. It's a secret language. There's the surface, and then there's everything underneath. Everything that we're giving out, that's the spirit of it. Um, Marcus, you know I went off tangent, and I need you to bring me back. <laughs> No, that's, that's right on. I think we'll continue with that, just thinking about the importance of uh, love songs. And also, I'll uh, let that rotate around. So I know Dreams work, of course, you worked in the music industry. You lived music. I know DJ Scholar, DJ Lenise, Den uh, Lene, Denise, sorry, you are in the crates with the music, teaching the music, ex exposing students to research of the music. And of course, music is always at the epicenter of, of insecure. So I think just thinking about that theme of love songs and how important it is, even in a, a difficult scenario, whether it's about a breakup, a breakdown, uh, how important it is to have love music in it, especially when we're giving it out to audiences who are in fact probably in desperate need of love. Yeah, I'll go. Um, I mean, love songs often are painful, the best of them. And, and even with this, this care and this that Sophia had for us, you know, in terms of like what she decided to leave out of this film and care, of course, for Latasha, um, it, do, it can't safeguard us. It can't protect us from some really hard truths that come up in this film. Um, and so I think about like, 
you know, this idea, let me look up her name. Is it Soon Jardu? Um, mm-hmm. Of Soon Jardu, you know, this warning um, mm-hmm. not going to her store, you know, this kind of um, foreshadowing experience that, you know, her best friend had had of having a gun pulled on her as she tried to count her change. Um, you know, and and what we probably, what an ice cube didn't have the language before maybe at that time, maybe not now, I don't know. I mean, I know that around 91, I started doing some of my like class work, like learning about class and, and starting to read Walter Rodney and just getting that, you know, kind of complex um, addition to whatever analysis I had around race and gender. And, you know, we don't talk about the merchant class because in Detroit, it would be the Arabs. Um, when I moved to New York in 1990, um, which is why I was in New York in 91 when this happened, um, what you call Marcus working in the music industry, I, I wasn't, but this panel isn't about me. I was at film, film school and I worked at a music magazine for 18 months when I was 19. I never worked in the music industry, but, um, but that whole dynamic is one about the merchant class, you know? Um, so I think about the violence of um, Soon Jia Du even before um, she kills Latasha Harlins. I think, and and when I stay with Latasha and that moment, and even the trauma that it caused, um, was that her best friend or her cousin who's telling the story about? Her her best friend, Ty. Her best friend. Um, I, you know, I, I think, quite frankly, I think about, well, I think about criminalizing Black corpses, which is what immediately happened to mm-hmm. Latasha afterwards. In fact, if you read her Wikipedia page, it's quite like, I, I always tell people do not read Wikipedia, but for these reasons alone, this could be a study in like what I've called criminalizing black corpses. Mm-hmm. They talk about a 15 year old who may have been um, a victim of a sexual predator. They use the word grooming. I'm talking about Latasha here. Like there's all of this like really strange information that's just kind of coming at you um, all to like make her life mean less, quite frankly, and to, you know, and therefore we have an understanding or we relate to the fact that um, Soon Jia Du didn't get the sentence that she should have gotten, um, that instead she paid a $500 fine and did however many hours of community service, um, which as you say in text in the last part of the last card of your film is one of the like kind of anim- things that animated the, the rebellion. Um, but I also think about Soon Jadu, and I don't, I think about um, in this moment where we're dealing with anti-Asian kind of sentiment um, and violence. Um, and of course, that's what happened um, during the rebellion in big part because of uh, what Soon Jadu, how she was terrorizing these black children and, and how that culminated. Um, I, I also think about, you know, who Soon Jadu was and, uh, how she, you know, what kind of, what animated, you know, what made her this terror to these young children. Obviously, I know that she didn't think that we were human. I've absolutely had that experience, like I said, in a interracial merchant class consumer in the hood dynamic with Arabs. Um, Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I just wonder, like, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, the store must have been robbed at some point. I have no, I mean, this was like, and I, this, that's not your work, Sophia, you know what I mean? But these are some of the things that I, I consider in this moment. Um, and there's no justification. And, you know, as someone who wants to identify as an abolitionist, I often don't because I wanted this woman underneath the jail, still do. Um, and I think about how her not, you know, receiving justice, Latasha not receiving justice and Soon Jia Du not receiving the sentence that she should have received created all of this other violence and harm to other random Korean folks in the merchant class in Los Angeles during the rebellion. Um, So it's a love song that's complicated by a lot of pain. Um, It's very complicated, but I I, I really appreciate how you're pointing out all the different 
aspects that need to be touched upon, Dream, because I feel like I've only touched the tip of the iceberg. Um, I, I, there, there's so much to explore regarding the social political disadvantages within South Central, um, the anti-blackness within the community, you know, the rise of liquor stores. Um, and it's sometimes the process was overwhelming for me because I was like, how do I tell this story without mentioning everything else that played a role into what caused this? Um, so thank you so much for that insight. <laughs> have to but, I mean I love that you just focused and kept us with Latasha you didn't you. you didn't have to do that labor thank it's, you it occurs to me thank you no it's it's a brilliant thought Marcus I want to mention very quickly the actual term love song came when my producer and music supervisor Fam Dorji and I met with um, Denise Harlan's ex-husband David I told him the project I was doing and I said, let's get together at Cam. Would you mind just talking to us? We just want to ask you some questions. And so he never met Latasha, but he was around during the time of the Latasha Harlan's Justice Committee. So he saw all the advocacy work that Denise was doing. And he told us this has to be a love song to her because he told me about the one book that actually painted a picture of her as a human and spent time with the family. But he said, this has to be a love song to Latasha. And it just stuck with us in that moment. Um, I think people often look at a love song as something that has to be intimate, but how is it something that holds us, that heals us, that allows space for us to exist in our fullness? And what's interesting is that just throughout the process, me always remembering what he told me when I called him right before I was going to interview Denise. I was extremely nervous. Uh, sorry, not Denise, before I was interviewing Shanice. I was extremely nervous because I look at Shanice and Ty as history. They still don't understand why I see them as history, but I hold them up on, on a pedestal. I think they're just brilliant, tremendous women who have survived so much. And I called David and I said, I'm meeting with Shanice, I'm extremely nervous. And he said, you have to talk to her like she's your sister. Like these, you were two black women together. This is your sister. So always having that care of a love song, of a sister, of family, of community, and wanting to make sure that care and intentionality was a part of the process. Thank you for that. And we're also, of course, uh, folks are watching us live. And so we've gotten a couple of questions I want to uh, integrate and I will uh, go to uh, Lene, Denise, and then Denise on this because I think you both can offer something. So one of the questions that we got was about how can creative communities expound on uh, e uh, economies of care for Black women and girls? So what is that relationship between uh, artistic and creative communities and uh, care economies for Black women and girls? I mean, so one of the things that comes up for me um, as a DJ and that also, you know, um, had me thinking about the approach to this film is sampling. And the way that we talk about sampling as a cultural practice, yes, but usually the voices that we're sampling or the, you know, the, the sort of folks that we, you know, refer to when thinking about sampling are men. Um, James Brown, Isaac Hayes, right? I was thinking about what it means to kind of excavate the voices of women, Black women, um, and thinking about the role that Black women's voices played in sampling, you know, thinking about Lynn Collins and the way that she sampled, the way that Aretha Franklin is sampled, and just what it means to go back to the past to kind of use these voices, these stories, these different art forms, these sort of, you know, different ways that Black women express being through the art to kind of tell these new stories, and thinking about sampling as a repurposing right, um, of, of sort of, or even thinking about sampling in terms of like found lost objects and what it means for us to kind of work with these sort of, yeah, sonic archives, visual archives, and to kind of reproduce, represent them in ways that are a whole lot more, you know, um, humanizing, but also using women's voices to do so. So, you know, thinking about what it means to sample the voices of Shanice and Ty and to kind of create this, I mean, I feel like the mixtape metaphor is overused at this point, but to kind of create this new collage with their voices, um, I think is, is an important thing to think about, especially, you know, I know the Sadia Hartman's name was, was called and thinking about Latasha and Ty and Shanice as wayward women and, and pulling from these expressions in the work of black women intellectuals to kind of engage who they are. Um, so yeah, you know, I think that 
it's important to kind of be able to draw from Black women intellectuals, Black women cultural workers to create these stories around little Black girls and kind of repurpose the sample to kind of create new sonic stories for us to engage outside of outside of that voice of trauma that typically sort of frames our, our daily living experiences. It's so true. Um, Lene, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, and I think to add to that, as you're talking about sampling, I, I think about um, what I see is a, a big problem in our industry, but also tapping into the audience, which is, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, supporting each other within the creative community to allow these stories to be told. Right, and to be able to give ourselves spaces to um, uh, allow uh, more stories of young black girls and women and things that seem invisible to the naked eye, seem invisible to, I think, the, the public space. Um, because so for so long, quite often, some of these stories, when they do get told, are told from a white male gaze perspective, right? And so to your point about allowing um, other people to come in and, and take care in uh, making sure these stories are told, not just thoughtfully, but more honestly. And I think going against what we think are, what we've already seen, right? I, I want to be very um, diligent about uh, supporting the creative community and people who want to tell more stories like this, because the, the truth is, until we all come have a seat at the table and support each other creatively, like the, they won't get told, right? And they all don't deserve to be told by one person either. And so how do we, again, uplift each other and allow safe spaces and, and pull each other up within the creative community to say, you know, Sophia, you have an idea like this. I want to support you by any means necessary because this is important. And, um, and to me, that's just, it speaks so, so many volumes because, uh, yeah, like uh, historically so, like our stories aren't being told and we're the only ones who are going to be able to tell it. So in order for that to be done um, and be done in earnest, uh, we have to support each other. Thank you for that wonderful insight. I'm gonna come back to you, Sophia. Uh, just a little transition is uh, part of when I was watching this magisterial 19 minutes was a great compliment. I'm a professor, so I started thinking, this is something I can use to teach students. You know, it's also at a, a, a very useful length as an instructor pedagogically. Like I could see students being able to get a sense of LA in the 90s, but most importantly, also as a compliment to my colleague, Brenda Stevenson's book, The Contested Murder of Latasha Harlins, and having students see it visually represented. And in particular, because what your film does is underscore the point that origins matter. If we only understand the LA uprisings as a product of Rodney King, that we're not understanding what it was like to be locally Black in LA at the time. That we're kind of getting a national part, but we're not also thinking about, as Lene Denise said earlier, if you're living in a city, you're watching both of those acts of trauma and violence on television day in, day out. And also, of course, we fast forward and we think about the other ancestor, Philando Castile, and the caught on, caught on video kind of experience that, well, Latasha's life is also demonstrating in some ways this foretelling of a future where getting caught on television is not going to get us the justice we think. And so how do we kind of forge a way forward thinking about that now that you're correcting, I think, importantly, the historical record through video, through film, that what if the origin of the LA riots was about a 15-year-old Black girl being murdered for no good reason, in addition to all of the rest of what was going on? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, Marcus. Um, Oh, it's a lot to sit with. Um, I think for me, the beginning of this project and throughout the end, I always thought this needs to be a living, breathing archive. This needs to be a correction to history. Um, this is an, this it's not even an alternate history because it's a true history. And I'm hoping that through this work, we're creating frameworks that challenge challenge the colonized form of documentary that we've been taught, challenge the extractive and manipulative tools we've, we've learned to extract stories. And what does it mean to care and to, to sit with one another and to remember collectively and how that is us rebuilding our own archive, rebuilding our own memory. So 
throughout this process, it always came about, I need the spiritual archive to exist. I need this history. I need people to know that this is who Latasha was. And I don't understand. I mean, I know systemically why this erasure has happened, but I don't understand why it's taken so long to have just this portion of the story told. Um, and even thinking about Ty, you know, Ty just recently started talking about Latasha. And Ty talks about how when she was a child, her parents really removed her from the situation. She and Shanice were both 15 years old. So what does that mean to be a young black girl in the South Central and you aren't even allowed to vocalize what you're experiencing, what it means to lose your friends. So not even thinking about just what does this film mean for the history of Los Angeles, but what does it mean for the healing? What does it mean for us to heal? I talk to Ty so often and just hear the light in her voice as she's remembering, as she's telling me all these different stories about Latasha. Ty is actually back in school now to finish her um, degree in criminal justice and just shows how these forms of storytelling can be a healing tool. It can be something to rebirth a memory that we all thought was gone. And so what does it mean for us to look at not only the craft of, of, of filmmaking, but the spiritual practice of conjuring ancestors, of remembering the past, present, and future, and not letting them exist as a very separate linear experience, but that time is constant, time is circular, and that as they're telling these stories of Latasha, her spirit is around us in that moment of it happening. Um, Lene, you mentioned so much how Los Angeles was a character, and so I, I'm so grateful that you said that because it's something I really wanted to bring to life. Me, I grew up in South Central during like Moesha time period. Um, you know, went to Baldwin Hills Elementary School, then Palms Middle School, and Lene, my best friend, was class president at Dorsey. What? Well, I went to Baldwin Hills Elementary too. Are you but... serious? That's another conversation, <laughs> girl. <Yes>. But wanting, <laughs> but but wanting to feel like Los Angeles was a living, breathing character in this. It is not just, you know, brick and mortar. It is something that carries memory all around us. There are times where Janice and I would just walk around South Central, sometimes never filming anything, but just listening to the silence. And by silence, I mean listening to what the average person what the average person would expect to be silenced, but we're listening for another vibration. We are listening for what are the secrets that are hidden and that are buried within South Central. There was a time where um, Ty took Sam and I, just drove us around the neighborhood and was like, this is where we got our ice tickles. Here's the swimming pool. And I know a Sam and I can both recognize what a spiritual moment that was of Ty lifting up and bringing, bringing Latasha's spirit into the existence with us. So always I think moving forward within film of us recognizing that we're not working within a normal realm we're not working within this everyday realm that people think we're existing and we are in conversation with other dimensions with with spirits with other forms of communication and it's up to us to tap into that to be open to that to listen to it so when I think of this film I call it a spiritual archive people are always thinking that it's reenactments or that I'm using archival footage. There's no archival footage within the film. And I don't like to call these reenactments. I call them spiritual reimaginings because we are wanting Latasha's spirit to live all throughout this piece. And it's not this curated form of an idea of what Latasha was, but how can Ty and Shanice's voice, voices be amplified? And how can we just add on the visual uh, and spiritual essence of the core of what they're saying? One thing I just want to add, actually, to kind of just like stay with this point around LA as a city and also thinking through Marcus's work um, and the importance of teaching Chocolate Cities in my class, um, which is a book that Marcus co-authored with Zandria Robinson and just an incredible resource for students to think through um, the importance of migration beyond this kind of great migration narrative is thinking about Chocolate City rituals. You know, and so the fact that um, Latasha and her family, her mother and her father, migrated to LA in 81 from East St. Louis is rich in terms of that sort of migration route and thinking about, first of all, what sort of traveled with them culturally. But again, I want to go back to the beach because the film, outside of her death again, made me think about this LA black city ritual of going to Venice Beach every Sunday, 
similarly to Detroit and Belle Isle, you know, just like, but the role of the beach um, and the role of the palm trees outside of this Hollywood context, right? But not only did we go to the beach and this sort of was, you know, memories of the beach was evoked through your film, but also that we left the beach and then traveled to Crenshaw to cruise on those Sunday nights as well, right? So just thinking about the chocolate city rituals that came through this storytelling, I thought was, was really important. And, and this kind of idea, of, I mean, to the West Coast, um, also comes up in this piece because again, the 1980s and the crack era, like what was the promise of opportunity in LA versus St. Louis? Um, and Ice Cube actually has a whole story around would admit to set, I mean, interestingly enough, to kind of travel between, no, I'm sorry, it's DJ Quick, just like Compton. Um, and the song, right, where he talks about St. Louis, it's just like Compton, right? What the connections are, it made me think about what the East St. Louis city rituals are. Um, you know, so just, just thinking about, again, not just the, the, the sort of character of Los Angeles as a city, but very specifically Black rituals in these cities that I feel like are highlighted in these little pieces through the film, including going to get French fries at one of those like, you know, Jack number five spaces where Shanice and Ty and Latasha would go off an after school, saving your 50 cents, sharing a plate of fries and making sure you have that quarter so that you can hear stand by me. You know, and just, just wanted to add that, just thinking about the city also is just this important story around migration for us to think through. Thank you. And what's interesting, Lene, about the beach is that was one of the earliest film uh, shoots. And I didn't, I don't think I understood in a language that I could describe at that moment. I didn't understand why the beach was so important, but I knew that water meant rebirth and water meant cleansing. And what's interesting about that is when we started to film the final parts of the, of the piece, Ty told me and Janice that the beach is where she goes. It is the most peaceful place. And so letting Ty end up at the beach at the end for how her rebirth is, mm -hmm. what her rebirth has looked like. Mm -hmm. And then that going back again to following these unconventional approaches to documentary, mm -hmm. the, feeling my spirit calling towards that ocean. And then Ty telling us maybe a year and a half later, the beach is where I go and have peace and solitude. Mm -hmm. um, so, so thank you for, for acknowledging that significance of the beach and the ocean. Thank you for that. And I'm going to come to uh, Dream uh, next uh, with this bridge. Uh, the bridge being, uh, I think also the ocean brought up for me, especially as an opener, the idea of libation for the ancestor. You know, this idea of pouring water for the ancestor because you're about to not only remember, remember or conjure memory, but do a thing that people also call rememory. Shout out to Erica Badu, she has a song like that. But the idea is that rememory in many ways is when we conjure a new something that was, you know, shrouded in something like pain or trauma, but in a way that helps us move forward in love. And so I wanted to ask a lot about the use of Black women's memory, Black girls' memory, and also what goes absent when certain things are not available to be shown or certain choices are made, made about what to show or not show in many ways to venerate the rememory of Black women and girls. And so I want to ask Dream and, of course, rotate through another circle of conversation. What does it mean to remember or do rememory work with Black women and girls' stories? Yeah. Well, um, there's a question also in the chat thing around someone watching the panel asked about um, Sophia's decision to use animation also. So I, I want to get to that question because I also think in addition to everything you just said, Marcus, um, it was a device that we used recently. Um, I did a, a, I was a producer of a documentary called It's a Hard Truth, Ain't It? on HBO. Um, that was co-directed by 11 brothers inside of um, a prison and to tell these parts of their stories that happened beyond the wall we also used animation we use um, the same guy who animated walls with Bashir um, and so 40 percent of that film is animated so so there's this question of like animating the story um, both literally, literally as an animation, but also what you're talking about, Marcus, this kind of spiritual animation 
to give to, and, and just think about, first of all, how tragic this is. Like, I understand, um, and I think it's gorgeous that, you know, Marcus and Sophia both have this inclination um, towards the spiritual to be positive and uplifting. But I think that it's um, deeply troubling that, you know, this is something, a practice that we as Africans in America have of um, having to memorialize like teenagers and children, you know, um, who were taken um, from us by anti-Black violence. Um, so here I'm thinking about Emmett Till, of course, um, you know, Latasha, Trayvon. Um, so these very short lives, I mean, what can at a certain point like these pieces of her life are true and you know and as much as documentary can be true or biography can be true anyway um and they're wisps but of course it's incomplete there is no full story of who latasha harlings is because she mm -hmm. is murdered in the 10th grade and even the piece sophia and i were kind of talking about this before the panel um, you know, Ty reads this, um, it's called a poem in the film, but what it feels like to me is those kind of snitchy things that teachers give children um, in middle school or grade school, where they're trying to find out who lives in your household, basically. Um, it starts really early when they ask your first grader to draw a picture of the house and the family, because they're trying to find out who's married, who's divorced, who's a single parent, who lives with their grandmothers. Um, that's why I'm calling them snitchy. <laughs> um, and, you know, so Latasha has this way of describing herself, um, this describe yourself in three ways. And I really love that one of the things that she talks about, because it speaks to this decade, this, this post-crack era that Lene was talking about and that I've written a lot about, um, she used the word ruthless. She's like, I'm caring, not like these ruthless people out here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, there's ruthless records at the time. That's like slang in LA. Um, but the film begins with a pretty ruthless <laughs> story of, of this, you know, black girl trying to swim in a public pool and almost being drowned, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Um, and Latasha kind of coming to her rescue. We all have stories like that, um, being black girls in the hood. So it also, so here I'm bringing in like the way that we talk about anti-Black violence, the way that we don't talk about like intergender violence, um, even though this film begins with that, is, is definitely not something that we haven't brought up to this point. We don't need to, you know, much. I mean, getting dunked in the um, pool by older boys was, I guess, a ritual, a rite of passage, being, you know, sexually harassed in a pool, public pool. Um, by older boys was absolutely uh, one of my rites of passage and all of my friends. Um, but even in this short period, so first of all, we're talking again, did you're talking, Marcus, about having practices that are well-established in our communities of memorializing and animating and breathing life into lives that were cut too short. And we have these well-established practices because it's a well-established thing that happens to us, right? And then to think of a life, you know, that absolutely had joy and she absolutely laid on her grass and, and like daydreamed. And when she was asked to write that snitchy essay about herself, even there, she was able to find a way to kind of impart who she was in her core, yeah. um, which was caring, um, which is evidenced in what little bit we do have of her biography. So all of those things, you know, um, it make me both angry, you know, um, and, 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 you know, yeah, angry and something. Uh, <laughs> I actually build on that because I think one of the things that I feel like gets lost in this, not the film, but just in the telling of her story period is the fact that her mother was murdered. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. By another black woman, but again, in the crack era, it's, it's actually, um, ah. God, I mean, think about gun, like this is actually a story about gun violence. Her mother is murdered. But I think also it was deep because I know that again, that's why I keep coming back to something that Dream said um, before we started of just like, you know, just thinking about 
are we people's memories of us is interesting just because yes, she wanted to be a lawyer, Latasha, and yes, she made straight A's at Westchester High School, which is very far from South Central. So it's also an interesting question around busing. But she wanted to be a lawyer, according to Denise Harlins, who I had a chance to speak to before she passed, because her mother's killer was given five years, pro five years in jail, right? And so she wanted to, you know, see this woman be put away for life. Yeah. So even the, the, the sort of inspiration around wanting to become a lawyer is connected to the fact that her mother was violently killed at a club. Um, and that's just, I, I, that, that's an interesting thing to think about too, and just the ways in which black girls had their childhood stripped in the crack era. Because what's interesting is she has to go to the store to get the orange juice. She becomes the mother to her brother and sister and, and younger cousins, right? She becomes this, this guardian figure. Um, but I just wanted to just kind of come back to her mother, yeah. you know, because that's just, it. That is, that's just a critical piece of the story that is often sort of just like, not glossed over, but just sort of mentioned and then moved on. Yeah. I mean, like, that's an interesting thing to put this five-year sentence in conversation with Soon John Ju's four-year, 400, what was it, 400 hours of community service, right? And she had to pay for funeral expenses, right? Um, to think about the role of her father um, and not to get into too much biography, because I do know that I don't know <laughs> what happened to this woman's life, to this little girl's life or what her family life looks like, but it is interesting to just, to just think about the role of her father. And I, I just keep coming back to the crack era and the kind of disappeared bodies in our communities, right? And that her mother and that, you know, Latasha herself became part of the disappeared disappeared by anti-black violence. You know, thinking about Daryl Gates at the time, who was police chief and the kind of enforcement of the chokehold, um, thinking about George Bush's presidency um, and the ways in which the National Guard showed up at my high school, fully armed, you know, automatic weapons, standing at the gate as we entered and exited, making it clear, <laughs> first of all, because Dorsey High School is one of the last black high schools in this Crenshaw district, um, making it clear that that rage needed to be contained, and I'm talking about post-riots, right? Showing up at this place where there are other little black girls in this high school, I was one, and police tanks, army tanks, because the Los Angeles Police Department was one of the first to be militarized, because the Los Angeles Police Department had full-on tanks moving through the South Central area in the form of what was called a batarang, running over homes, looking for crap, sometimes killing older black women, young children, right? So, I mean, the story, while beautifully told, and yes, thinking about ritual, and even thinking about the importance of speculation and filling these sort of archival gaps is just sort of framed by this intense, long history, thinking about the LA riots in 1965 of anti-black violence. And, and I just think that is also important to think through as well. Absolutely. Something that really struck me throughout this process, I was doing research on uh, the adultification of Black girls, and there was a study that came out called Girlhood, Girlhood Interrupted, the Erasure of Black Girls' uh, Childhood, and just looking at how young Black girls have always been seen as a threat, how they are seen to mature faster than their white counterparts. But what's interesting is understanding this idea of adultification is when you go back and read the court documents, um, Judge Joyce Carlin does not see do to be a threat to society. You know, she mm -hmm. sees her actions to be warranted. She, she says, did she react inappropriately to Latarsha Harlan's? Absolutely. But was that overreaction understandable? I think it was. That's right. her response right. to say this young girl, 15 year old, was seen as a threat. So what is so, I think something that I'm working to do in, in, in the film is take away how the body has been policed of a black girl. How mm -hmm. can we, how can we take away that how black girls have been seen as this threat, how our bodies have always been something from Sarah Bartman to present that has been a, a, a study that people are looking at us as something that needs to be tamed, as something that is uncontrollable as, as a threat. And so I just, 
I wanted to see black girls as someone that could just exist in their environment, still understanding all the daily threats that they are experiencing as women, as black girls in South Central. Um, and so it's just really shocking to read how the judge considered Latasha Harlins to be a threat. And she even goes on to say that if she were still alive, she would be here right now. You know, she would have to stand before me in the, in the court and, and be prosecuted as well. I, I want to add a quick, quick thing around the fact, because that now these, these, I'm, I'm being reminded of the fact that at this very time, um, black women were being killed by a serial killer, ended up being a black man. Yes. Yes. Deeper, you yes. know, and that Latasha Harlan's mother, coming back to her, fits the description of someone who, or the profile rather, of someone who was typically killed by him, you know, um, women who were struggling with crack addiction, um, in LA, I mean, I'm just thinking about just this kind of conversation and even the way that Latasha Harlan's name gets erased in the telling of the LA riot story, um, when really it also inspired over 200 liquor stores that were burned down in our communities owned by non-Black people. And that's another thing that is like rarely discussed is that 200 <laughs> liquor stores were burned down. <laughs> Right, like, I, I just want us to sit with that. And also it was discovered that there were over 400 liquor stores in our communities, right? Um, Florence and Normandy, right, is this place where one of the first buildings, you know, burned, owned by an Asian person. And I do, and I think it's important for us to think about, yes, anti-Black racism, but also this, this really interesting tension between Jung Du's family in particular, immigrants and, closely connected to the church while selling liquor in black communities as a way to sort of um you know um survive los angeles i mean it's just that there are just these these stories that i think require us to kind of ask different questions when thinking about her story outside of biography this is, <laughs> this is an interesting thing i don't know this is a, a question that dream and i have been in a conversation that dream and i have been in for like the last two years around the usefulness um, of a biography that perhaps at the very least we can use it to kind of think about what else is happening, you know, in, in the worlds that these folks are, are dealing with in the day to day outside of the sort of biographical facts that we sometimes find pleasure in. And I'm guilty of that. <laughs> I will look for a biography like, oh, she's a Capricorn. Let's get it, you know, like, but no in asking a few more questions <laughs> beyond the biography and then linking it to the whole, right? We, we are discovering an important pattern, obviously. Not discovering, but we, we've- Yeah, I, I wanted to ask- This is general sort of anti-Black. I just want to say something real quick on the pattern thing too. And I know we're supposed to wrap up eight minutes ago. So I'm gonna let you do that, Marcus. But um, obviously real quickly, we're looking at um, this pattern. I mean, this is what, you know, led as we have established on this panel to the LA rebellion. And, um, you know, what we saw immediately um, after folks um, rose up in Ferguson was, <laughs> you know, this videotape of, Mike Brown um, interacting with an immigrant merchant, <laughs> the merchant class, you know, someone he knew his whole life, the store owner over a blunt, right? Um, and being accused in the mainstream media of them being a thug and a thief, right? So much so that that, um, I believe the uh, store owner was Palestinian. He had to come out and say, no, he didn't, he paid for his blunt. <laughs> We, he was mushing me over something else. Like we were getting into an argument because I've known this boy since he was in diapers. Um, but you know, the way that, that that video again was tried to weaponize to kind of like say y'all are out here riding for a thug. It wouldn't have mattered by the way, had my brown not paid for a $3 blunt. I can't even believe blunts cost $3 now, but um, it wouldn't have mattered if my Brown had, you know, taken that blunt or not taken it, you know, but that was immediately the media's kind of way of, you know, pushing back. Um, and so, I, you know, I, just this, all this information about, you know, the Wikipedia, I, I really encourage people to look thoroughly at this wiki entry of, um, Latasha Harlins and think, and then maybe look at some other, you know, um, wiki pages. I don't know if it's children who were killed in Columbine or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. and, and see if they try to add all of the like awful things that may have been in their lives, you know, prior to this tragic incident that was more than tragic, you know, that was anti-Black violence. I know, oh, sorry, go ahead, Marcus. No, I was just going to add, I think that's, that's the one thing that really stayed with me. And, and uh, again, Sophia, your short, just, it's so thought provoking while also providing a space for healing, to be honest, because you can't help but think about all of these things that went into this event, but more importantly, why, right? Why didn't people talk enough about her and who she was? Um, and I keep saying as a human, because at her core, that's who she was, right? She was a young black girl, but she, you know, you could have made her any other race and she would have still been human and whole. And why, to Dream's point, um, you know, the history of race in America, the history of black people in America through media has always criminalized us. It's always portrayed us as thugs, as people who are bad. And so you, you can't help but think about even that time and coming out of the 80s, more importantly, you know, why merchant owners and shop owners will immediately criminalize us, whether they know us or not, right? It's because we're being depicted in, in such a way and, and Latasha Harlan's death only amplified that to a degree, right? It only showed the proof that again, you could have money, you could come in there and just be running an errand, but yet, you know, you can get off with probation and, and jury service because why wouldn't she feel threatened, right? But it's like, but that, we, we are victims of, of this long history of people not, you know, not being able to take control and ownership in our stories. And I think to kind of tie it back in why it's so important, like this film is made and that more, sto excuse me, more stories continue to be put in the forefront of not just black women, but all, um, you know, all different cultures that have for so long been suppressed and telling mainstream stories is because it's so important to see that we are all just humans and having shared similar experiences, having that empathy in character and storytelling and how it all connects us, right? Um, and that is the biggest piece of importance here too, where, you know, you did such a beautiful job showing her as someone who is just fully bodied and who she was as a person, and that can never be forgotten, right? No matter what she's portrayed on a Wikipedia page, no matter what they say in the history books, she was a young black girl with uh, so much life to live. And that I think is, is, is devastating. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Before I close out, I just wanna come back to Sophia and ask her to let the good people know the future of the film and where they can access it and how they can access it. Yeah, that's a thoughtful question. Um, so we are finally finishing our festival run and we're in some conversations about distribution and where the film will live. But at the end of the day, I really want this to be for South Central. Um, I want this to be for the community. I want this to be you know, an archive for us to remember. But uh, you can go to the website, a love song for Latasha.com to stay up to date on what the film is doing. But it is not public at the moment just because it's finishing festival. So thank, thank, thank you, Black Star, for allowing me to screen the film this weekend. I want to thank Lene Denise. I want to thank Denise Davis. I want to thank Dream Hampton, and I want to thank, of course, Sophia, the creator, for having what I feel to be a venerating conversation in a very difficult time about a very difficult topic. And the thing that is great about veneration and love is that when you venerate others, you will be venerated and loved in the process. I thank you each for sharing yourselves during this very difficult time for people. I hope that those who are watching are feeling the love and all of the brilliance that came from each of these women during this conversation about a brilliant woman gone too soon. And that we remember that no matter what the times are, love is truly the message. Thank so. you so much. Thank you all so deeply for being in conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Bye.